Um, but hello and, and welcome again, uh, everybody. So it's great to be back uh, with you. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, data protection, GDPR, and of course, uh, data breaches. We'll be together for about an hour this morning. Uh, and it will equip you well for those of you who need to get onto the, uh, the, the BAT system and to do the respective exams. Um, so without any further ado, then, let's, uh, let's get on the way um, and talk about why data protection and GDPR is so important. Just letting some more link comes in. <clears throat> so I think it's... Uh, I think we all know that in this day and age, given what we're doing this morning, it's, it's impossible to, uh, to, to work and live without generating data. We're generating a, a video at the moment, so uh, that will be available to Charlie and the team after the, uh, after the session. But we very much live in data times. And I read a quote the other week that said, you know, data is, is the new oil. It's so important to, uh, to come up with this. So because of that, uh, governments and other authorities have decided that uh, images images. Images. will need to be given rights, uh, yeah? And they should have the right to understand how their data has been used in the first place, what it's been used for, to be able to see it, to be able to access it, and um, if they are happy with what's been held on them because they don't think it's accurate, to seek rectification of, uh, of the data that's, uh, that's been held. <clears throat> and uh, we need to, to be cognizant that they take an active role in giving consent to the data collected on them. So as you'll see as we move through the workshop, they have to actually opt in. They can't kind of opt out. Uh, and I guess we're all getting more and more used to that these days, wherever we go surfing on the web and it comes up with, with cookies which are part of the GDPR regime, we actually have to actively give our consent that they can use cookies when we're uh, browsing their different websites. And there are actual guarantees that underpin all this confidentiality and how data is treated. And, and those guarantees are actually enforced in statute. And we'll go on and look at how, they, how that's enforced and who enforces it in, uh, in just a moment. So just building on, on those points then in terms of, of why data is important, <clears throat> you know, when we're dealing with our clients, we now have a duty laid down by that regulation to, to inform them what information we're seeking from them. Why we're seeking that particular information what we're actually going to be doing with the information that we're going to uh, collate from them. <clears throat> and importantly, particularly in our industry, who else may be involved along with your good selves in providing services to them? So you think that we are intermediaries, we're gonna be dealing with a number of providers. Um, so other people, other providers, other data controllers will be involved in that as well. <clears throat> And we also have to give them information on how the information is going to be stored, how it's secure, and how it will be transferred between different kind of entities. And then importantly, you know, what will happen if, uh, you know, with the information when it's no longer required? Because the rules say that if we don't actually need the data, then we have to get on and delete it. So that's just a little bit of a, a signpost, really, in terms of, and I'm sure you already know that anyway, why data protection is so important, where GDPR actually uh, comes into play, and we'll unpack that in, in more detail in a minute. But these are actually the, the formal learning objectives. So we've started to understand the context of data security. In a moment, I'll just refresh your memories on some of the key terms around data protection. Again, refresh your memories on what's known as personal and what constitutes sensitive personal uh, information uh, data. You'll need to know the difference between the two, particularly those of you who are going on to do some of the, uh, the exams. <clears throat> we'll then unpack in quite some detail the key principles of GDPR and importantly for us all, how to remain compliant within that regime so we don't have any unforeseen kind of issues and problems. What constitutes a breach of personal data? 
where to go, how to report that. And at the end of it, for us all that need to get on and do the exams to feel confident that we can get on and, and have a crack at those and uh, come out successful. So what is data protection then? So <clears throat> when we look at the definition, data protection is all about avoiding harm. And it's about avoiding harm to individuals. That's, that's a key point, either by misusing or mismanaging their personal data. So for those of us who collect, use or store personal data, then the Data Protection Act definitely applies to us. And as I said in the intro, what that act does, it actually gives out some very strict rules and guidance as to controlling how information is used and make sure that we all have to follow the, the rules, the data protection principles. <clears throat> So personal data, the definition of personal data is about any living individual which is capable of identifying that individual. Now that's kind of a, a key definition that would be good to, uh, to remember. Sensitive personal data is slightly different because what sensitive personal data enables somebody to do is to maybe to form a biased opinion or, you know, discriminate in some way, shape or form against them. So there shouldn't be any surprises for the fact that in terms of sensitive personal data, there's stronger legal protection for individuals around that kind of data that could be used to their absolute detriment. <clears throat> so in terms of those definitions then, let's have a look. I'm sure there will come as no surprise to, to you in terms of what constitutes personal information. It's kind of that run of the mill stuff in terms of who you are, where you live, some of your contact details. <clears throat> and that's where we start to see online activities being um, called out for the first time in terms of cookies. Yeah. So remember, personal information, we can use that to identify individuals. So that kind of makes more sense now by having that kind of set of data we could identify who those individuals are, what their contact details are, and we could kind of look at their online activities, look at some of the analytics data, and know what their interests are. Uh, and as you'll see, when you go surfing, if you don't switch off the right cookies, you get lots of market information coming at you. <clears throat> in, ter in terms of uh, the more sensitive information, again, there'll be no surprises here. Uh, you all right, Whoever that yeah, is, can bad. you uh, um, hello? I had a call Whoever's from Steve, the, the bookkeeper yesterday, please. And um, the, the money that you owe, a, a decent proportion. I think it was him. <laughs> yes. Um, so sensitive personal information, that's something that can be used to discriminate or for somebody to form a biased opinion about anyone. So as you can see, this is about things like, you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, that kind of thing. Much more sensitive information, much stronger safeguards in place. <clears throat> so you can clearly see how you will discriminate between the two sources of information. And again, that's good information to, to know and have refreshed. So I've been banging on, haven't I, about data protection uh, and saying it's part of law. And it actually became law quite a while ago now. Um, back in 2018, it became law, went on to the statute book. And the Data Protection Act actually implemented GDPR. I mean, we're all, we all live and work with GDPR now. We're all very familiar with what the requirements are. But it's the Data Protection Act that actually brought it into force. And as you know, GDPR is a European directive. So European directives have to be kind of uh, implemented in, in the countries that belonged to the, uh, the Union. And even though we've now gone through Brexit and we're outside of the, uh, the EU, GDPR is embedded into our statute. So we need to continue to abide by that directive and the statute that kind of wraps around that. Now, the bad news is that the, if you looked at the GDPR kind of directive, there are 99 articles contained within that. But on the upside, the good news is only seven of them apply to UK financial services. Now, as I said, in, in terms of the introduction, um, 
you know, our compliance with data protection and GDPR in particular is, regu is a regulated activity and it's enforced. But this isn't something that's um, enforced by the FCA. I mean, of course, there are FCA principles that we still need to adhere to. And there's necessarily some interdependencies between GDPR and other principles we have to comply by. But GDPR is taken so seriously and data protection is taken so seriously that we have our own uh, regulator who regulates and enforces GDPR. And as, of course, as I'm sure you all know, that's the Information Commission's Office or the ICO for short. And we'll be taking a look at breaches and the ICO as we get towards the, uh, the end of this particular training session. So that's where GDPR came from. That's the statute that, that introduced it. And at the same time, we also needed to become familiar with some of the terminology that went with data protection. So as I'm sure you know, for refresher purposes, the data controller is either a person or it's a firm who ultimately has responsibility for complying with the act and determines the how and the what of data processing for their particular organization, yeah? Now, I know a lot of you would work very closely with, uh, with IFAC on this in terms of, you know, what good compliance looks like in terms of both data protection and GDPR, but nevertheless, ultimately, you will be responsible for that as the controller. <clears throat> and then this, this one catches most of us. This is the data pr processor type of, uh, of role which is any individual who's using data um, on behalf of the controller. So any of us who touch data in any way, shape or form, whether we're in an advisory role, whether we're sitting in administration or, or back office function, we are regarded as data processors. And I know increasingly we uh, contract out services. We may be buying in services from third party suppliers and any parties who are handling data on your behalf are also regarded as processes. And as you'll see, we need to have some good contractuals in place between us and third parties in order to satisfy the requirements of the Data Protection Act and GDPR. Unsurprisingly, I guess, the, the data subject is actually the person about you know, whom the data refers to, who you're processing the data on in our world, I guess. Typically, that's the clients. So typically, they're the data subjects. Doesn't have to be. Could equally be employees or shareholders, <clears throat> you know. But the, uh, the vast majority will be around clients. <clears throat> and personal data processing is anything at all that you do to or do with personal data, including the storage of that data. And just to debunk a myth at this stage, a lot of people leap to the... Uh, the conclusion that this has to be everything that's stored on a computer. That isn't actually the case when you dip into the Data Protection Act and GDPR. This equally applies to non-electronic processing and storage as well. So if you think about those of you who still maybe have paper-based client files, the storage of that personal data, the rules and regulations are equally applicable to non-electronic. And then uh, there's a, an individual called the data protection officer who fulfills a specific role. And in some uh, organizations, this is a legal requirement. Uh, public authorities would be a good uh, example of that. Um, it's not compulsory for a firm to have a DPO if you can demonstrate that you're G, uh, GDPR compliant. So you may or may not have that specific role. So unlike, you know, you need an SMF uh, 1617 uh, enroll, you don't necessarily need a DPO if you can, through your other systems and processes, demonstrate you're being compliant with GDPR. Not all sectors have that luxury, particularly in the public sector. So I was talking about the storage and security of data, just to put a little bit uh, more meat on the bones. As I said, the data controller is responsible for all data, regardless of the format of it. So within your firm, you need to make sure that there can be no unauthorized access, not just to computer files, but paper files as well. So 
general data protection measures should be to, in the first instance, make sure you protect the data, secure it as soon as possible after collection. If it gets stolen, if it gets lost, that's going to be a breach. Also, lock it away. I know at this stage people kind of are taught and everything and in the office, you know, many hours a week. But it is really important that data is locked away, whether that's in a filing cabinet um, and, you know, the key not being uh, visible or in an easy to find place, or even lock it away digitally. And that includes things like moving away from your workstation and not forgetting to, to lock your screen so that other people can't access it, even accidentally. Because if they flicked one of the, uh, the keys on the computer and it came out of sleep mode into life and they inadvertently saw some data, that would actually be a breach that you need to deal with if they weren't authorised to look at it. And the other thing, as I said earlier, is that you, as soon as data is no longer needed, it should be securely destroyed. So you shouldn't be hanging on to data unnecessarily just in case. Okay. <clears throat> as I said earlier, if you're using a third party provider, then uh, the subject, the, uh, the data subject, should have given you permission to do that. And I know you've kind of got that um, baked in and embedded to your current processes, but that's kind of why it's there. It is all driven by the requirements of the Data Protection Act. <clears throat> so that's kind of the contextual piece uh, in terms of data protection, its origins, why it's there, some of the terminology, which I'm conscious for the vast majority on the call is just a refresher. What we're going to do now is to get into more detail on GDPR. We're going to unpack it in a little bit more detail. Let's just start off by refreshing our memories with some of the, the main differences, what happened as a result of GDPR getting enacted in that 2018 Act. Well, first and foremost, the key aim was to strengthen data privacy and really promote rights. That was the key difference. It really gave teeth to individuals in terms of equipping them with rights around their own personal data. So it couldn't be kind of abused in any way. <clears throat> And what it does in reality is it gives our clients a far greater control over how their data is controlled and how it's processed. And it also gives you as consumers that same level of control. So it doesn't kind of differentiate, you know, we're not being hard done to in financial services. We're merely complying with the same legislation that everybody in all sectors has to comply with. <clears throat> One of the key requirements is that at firm level, you have to evidence knowledge and implementation of data protection procedures. So one of the ways, no doubt, you'll be doing that is by uh, attending this course and saying that, you know, you've been refreshed or you get refreshed annually in terms of your knowledge and understanding. I don't know, some of you may be working with IFAC, um, maybe having audits on, uh, on how well you're complying with things like GDPR. <clears throat> the other thing is all firms need to be much more transparent about the ways in which we use um, our client data. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here because it's so well kind of baked in to our processes now in terms of privacy notices, etc., that we do it almost on automatic pilot without thinking about it. <clears throat> there are much stricter rules these days around disclosure of data breaches. So, you know, if you don't disclose a data breach to the ICO, that's when you could get in, in very hot water. As you'll see later on during the training session, there are some quite eye-watering kind of fines they can levy. And just out of interest, I did some research yesterday, and although it doesn't really make, uh, make the press, They've been very active during uh, 2021 with, uh, with making fines for uh, GDPR breaches. So good to remain safe. <clears throat> so as I said, swinging fines for non-compliance, you could, you could, and I say, uh, go up to 20 million euros, which at the last exchange rates 
somewhere between 17 and a half and 18 million quid or four percent of your annual global turnover whichever is greater so you know i say uh, aren't mucking about here in terms of the maximum amount of fines they are prepared to uh, or have the capacity uh, indeed to levy <clears throat> In terms of your obligations, as you know, when you're working with your clients, you have to give them some very simple, straightforward and concise information that people can understand. Okay, so we've got some background noise. I'm going to see if I can deal with that. <clears throat> so what we need to do is to tell them uh, which of their personal data is being stored, why we're storing the data, and importantly, how. <laughs> how we're going to be using it. And the lawful basis for processing such data. So, you know, very straightforward in our industry. We're processing it because you know, we want some financial planning done and we need to talk to providers and we need to understand information in order to procure the right products and services for you as a client. Yeah. But you're not allowed to take data, respective of sector, unless you've got a lawful basis for doing so. And you need to be able to articulate that. As I say, for us, it's, uh, it's quite straightforward. <clears throat> so in terms of the, uh, the main aspects of, uh, of GDPR, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to, to chunk these down into the different areas. We'll start off by looking at accountability and governance, which is kind of the umbrella of GDPR, and then we're going to do a deeper dive into each of the six areas underneath that one by one, if that makes uh, if that makes sense. So, from an accountability and governance perspective, as I said, this is the overarching theme which all of us in our firms need to demonstrate that we're adhering to. <clears throat> so, basically, what we have to do is say, right, we take data privacy. Uh, very seriously, and it's absolutely integral to how we work. And we can show you this, we can demonstrate how we've built it in to our processes and systems. <clears throat> As I said earlier, uh, data privacy isn't just a client-facing activity. For those of us who have got employees, for those of us who have got shareholders, you know, data privacy applies to everybody. Think about your life as a consumer outside of FS. You know, these data privacy rules apply to you as consumers and clients of other businesses too. <clears throat> uh, they're very clear uh, that all staff must be aware of responsibilities under GDPR and provided with training. So I think that's why we've had such a strong turnout uh, this morning. And no doubt some of you will be... Uh, will be cascading this information down to uh, to other staff within your firms who you feel need to uh, to have a refresher uh, on it. <clears throat> As you'll see later on in the training session, there's some clear guidance uh, and requirements around breaches. Um, so I'll unpack this in more detail for you as part of that session. But basically, this is like anything in financial services when we're talking about our, our other regulator, the FCA. It's all about an audit trail. So we need to be able to demonstrate to a third party satisfaction that the risk of data breaches has been assessed. Not that we've had data breaches, but we've actually done a risk assessment. And again, I know a lot of you have probably been working with, with IFAC in terms of an audit to, to make sure you're you're kind of as bulletproof as you can be with that. <clears throat> um, this is about things not being written aspect, I guess. It's in terms of, you know, where you have um, found a risk, and that's not a problem. You will find a risk from time to time. What have you done to, uh, to mitigate it? No. <clears throat> um, We'll deal with that. We'll deal with questions at the end. So evidence of, of risk that uh, data breaches has been assessed and evidence of plans to mitigate risk and reduce the likelihood of, of harm to individuals. Now, 
What GDPR did for individuals, it introduced eight individual rights. Now, at this stage, I wanted to actually give a plug for, for Charlie and the team at, uh, at IFAC, <clears throat> because on the, the BAT system, uh, which I'll uh, show you in, in, in a while in terms of where to access your exam, there are some absolutely superb uh, training materials that would support uh, a session like this. So if this isn't one of your strong suits in terms of GDPR and data protection, um, there are some further excellent materials available to you that you can have a read through, particularly uh, before the, uh, the exam, just to get yourself refreshed. And there's an excellent paper that talks to the eight individual rights that have been conferred on individuals from, uh, from GDPR. I am going to look at these eight rights, but I'm only going to look at them in headline detail. If this is an area where you feel you need a stronger support, then I heartily recommend that you log on to the BAT system and have a, have a wee read of this before you get stuck into uh, to the exam. So what are the individual rights? I'll just uh, go through them. Uh, get them up on screen. And as I say, I'll go through them each in a little bit more detail to headline level. <clears throat> so basically it's the right to be informed. And that's, we've, we've just been talking about that to know what data is being collected and why. Rights and access, yeah. So subject access requests, all that kind of good stuff. Um, to put stuff right, put data right, if they feel that it's inaccurate. Uh, there is uh, some limited rights to, uh, to erasure, where they can ask for data to be removed. It's called the right not to follow. Um, certain restrictions around processing that may come into play. Uh, everybody these days has the right to data portability. This is, again, from a regulatory perspective, the fact that the data is actually theirs and belongs to them. So we should be able to, to move it around freely without restriction. Now the right to object to you using a data, and primarily that's around direct marketing. And they have rights uh, around uh, automated decision-making profiling. Yeah, um, the land of kind of robo advice kind of scenarios. So those are at headline level. I've kind of plugged the, uh, the training materials. As I said, I'm just going to go into just at a headline level, uh, nothing, nothing more. <clears throat> so I think we've already covered the uh, the right to be informed. We cover this off right at the front, the time the data is collected from them. As I say, that's really well baked into our processes. They do have the right of access. Um, we know these subject access requests. We have to provide an SA off uh, without charge, uh, without unduly delay, but at, at least within a month of receipt having had an SAR. If an individual feels that the data that will hold on them is in some way incomplete or inaccurate, then we must uh, listen to that and without undue delay, again, within one month, deal with that issue. If when you, uh, when you read the rules and regulations, uh, it's felt that that is manifestly unfounded or excessive, then you can go back to the individual and apply an extension for up to two months. We have to give you a rationale as to why that is. Uh, and there are no real guidance on what manifestly unfounded or excessive is. You have to use your judgment on that. <clears throat> as I say, they do have the right to be forgotten. Um, and those requests can either be uh, verbal or written. Again, got a month to, to deal with that. That's not an absolute right, and it can only apply in certain circumstances. If you want any more meat on the bones, again, I refer you to that excellent uh, paper. <clears throat> they have the right to restrict processing. So lots of similarities there to, uh, to rectification, um, but it may be more on a temporary basis. This. So you're taking temporary action you know, either moving data from one system to another, making data temporarily unavailable while you look into that. Uh, and again, you've got a month in order to, uh, to remediate that. As I've said, data portability, key these days when we're all moving to other IT-based systems. Um, you need to do it without any hindrance to usability. So you must use something called an open access system, which I know we probably all do in FS, otherwise we couldn't, couldn't do our business. And again, you're getting used to this kind of pattern now without undue delay, 
the latest within the month. But if it's a complex request or there's a lot of requests, again, uh, no definition on what that might look like, you can request a further, a further extension of up to two months. <clears throat> they can object to their data being used, and if they uh, don't want their data to be used for direct marketing purposes, this is slightly different because you do have to stop that immediately. So if somebody uh, requests, you don't contact them from a direct marketing point of view, there's no leeway there, you don't get up to a month, you must action it straight away. No exemptions to that, no grounds to refuse it. Uh, and you'll find that's why when you go surfing yourself as a consumer on websites, there's lots of uh, marketing cookies trying to um, ascertain whether or not you're happy uh, to, uh, to go along with that and be marketed to. As I say, something that probably doesn't affect us uh, so much in, uh, in our firms, this is more about uh, robo advice, automated decision making. Um, and basically what this does, it says, because information is being done automatically, uh, information has to have uh, alternative ways either to uh, challenge decisions or request some sort of human intervention. You know, so a human stepping in the way of the automated process. <clears throat> so those are the eight individual rights which we've looked at at the headline level. Let's dip into the personal data inventory now. So as you know, you must be able to produce an accurate and reliable inventory that says this is the personal data that we're processing. This is why we're doing it, and this is the lawful basis that we're doing it on. Mm. This is where we're going to be storing the data. This is any third parties who are processing data on our behalf, and not all data requires consent. Some doesn't, and if it doesn't, we're gonna tell you what, what doesn't. So that's the personal data inventory. In terms of consent, which is the last point, not always required. Where it is required, it must be given freely, it must be specific, it must be informed and unambiguous. In other words, <clears throat> no uh, small print, no, if you don't tick the box you're in, you have to positively be ticking boxes to say we're giving consent. Opt in, not opt out, yeah? Silence in activity of, or pre-box ticket is not acceptable forms of consent. So the key takeaway here is when we're talking about consent, it always has to be proactive consent on an opt-in rather than an opt-out basis. <clears throat> in terms of suppliers, third parties, um, you of course you'll be aware of uh, third parties that are processing personal data on your behalf. Under GDPR, even though you've got an agreement with a third party, ultimately it's you at firm level who are on the hook, yeah? So the data processor also has certain legal obligations. So that's why I said at the start, really, what's critical, and I know you would have done this, is you'll have a very uh, specific contract drawn up between you and the third party in terms of what their legal, legal obligations are, what their service level agreements, you know, what their risk assessment is, blah, 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 what their contingency plans are in terms of data security, and you'll be able to evidence all of that in terms of the third party relationships. And the firm has recourse against the processor if they breach that contract. So if they are found to uh, have a data breach or been or foul of the GDPR rules, then it should be uh, contractually possible for you to go back and to challenge them. In terms of privacy notices, I think we're all kind of uh, familiar with them because we get them out almost on a daily basis. Um, as I said earlier, must, must be free, talks to the client in a simple way about um, how their data is, uh, is going to be used, who's going to be using it, why it's being collected, who it will be shared with, and what the effect will be on the individual concerned, i.e. they'll get products and services that they, they want. The final kind of element of GDPR 
that, uh, that I wanted to talk to was uh, with data security and breach notification. But because that is so important and so um, entwined with the ICO, I'm going to do that as a, as a, as a separate kind of session. <clears throat> So let's have a look at subject access requests in just a little bit more detail because there's some key information on here for you. So individuals, as we know, can ask to have a copy of their personal data. Where you receive such a request, the deadline is slightly different. It's not up to a month. The deadline is 20 working days. Yeah. <clears throat> as I said, individuals do have the right to be forgotten and they can ask you to delete any data they hold on them. You don't have to do that. Uh, there are certain conditions. Again, I refer you back to that paper if you want chapter and verse on that. But if you need to legally hold on to that data to meet your legal obligations, then you, you're not going to be deleting it even though they want to be forgotten. They can make a subject access request in, in, in any way they like, really, uh, verbally or in writing, and including these days good old social media. So. It's almost like, what can't you do by social media these days? <clears throat> From your perspective, as you already know, you can't uh, charge uh, for the data. Uh, you must uh, provide it uh, within uh, one month of receipt and must be in a concise and in, uh, intelligible format. <clears throat> for those of you who are looking for some sort of uh, checklist in terms of how we can uh, meet our GDPR obligations, got some, some uh, thought starters here. I wouldn't say it's definitive, but it's a really good starter for 10. So when thinking about complying with G GDPR, are you providing your clients with a privacy notice and informing of them of their rights? I would suggest that you would definitely be doing that, yeah? <clears throat> How often are you carrying out an audit and have you created a personal inventory detailing the legal grounds for each piece of data stored, yeah? So this is what we talked about in the personal data inventory. Could you evidence that you've actually done that? How often is it being done? Is it an annual activity in your firm? <clears throat> Go back and satisfy yourself in terms of what data requires consent. Uh, make sure that consent meets the requirements of GDPR. Remember, it's all about consent and opt-in. What are you doing on that basis? Work with IFAC on that. <clears throat> if you haven't, if you have not uh, got express consent, then you can't store the data, so you have to delete it. So make sure that any data you, you're holding you've got consent to store it. <clears throat> As I said earlier about working with third parties, uh, always good or essential, not good, to have a contract in place. Just revisit the contract, make sure, make sure it's GDPR compliant in terms of uh, the data that's flowing between and being processed. Have you got systems and procedures in place both to manage and report data breaches. If you fell, if a data breach happened, would you know where to go, how to deal with it in a timely way? <clears throat> where a client actually asks to see their personal data, how easy would that be to do? Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever done a kind of uh, client journey in terms of how you would action that and meet, meeting your deadlines? Are you confident that all data is secure, stored appropriately, and you've got restrictions in place that mean it can only be seen by the relevant people uh, that have authorised to see it? Be proactive. How can you report that the firm is GDPR compliant? And again, I know a lot of you will work with IFAC maybe on an annual basis to demonstrate that you are complying with everything that happens in terms of GDPR. So there was just a number of kind of thought starters. I know um, IFAC have probably got their own more comprehensive checklist. You've probably built your own. That's just my kind of start of the 10 really in terms of some of the key areas that you should be thinking about. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to move into uh, to data breaches, which is a, a key part 
of this, this, this training session, not least because you need to be able to, uh, <clears throat> to demonstrate you know what needs to happen because it's, it's so important. So as you know, this is something that was introduced by GDPR. It absolutely introduced a data on you, on you as the data controller to understand what constitutes a personal data breach and where one has happened, then you may want to, well, you definitely want to go on and investigate it, and you may want to report that up to the ICO. <clears throat> so when you look at the broad definition of a personal data breach, it's a breach of security that leads to accidental or unlawful destruction or loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of access, to personal data, transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. Bit of a mouthful there. The key takeaways from there is it doesn't matter if it was, um, you know, if it's unintentional. I guess most breaches, you know, unless it's unlawful, like you're uh, subject to a uh, a phishing attack, and I know you had a session on cyber security last week. That's why that's so important that you could be under attack for people, because data is so important. But a lot of the times, breaches happen is actually accidental. Nevertheless, that would still be regarded potentially as as a breach. And it's not just sending data; it's storing it or processing data as well. So. In, in some there, it's more than just about losing personal data. It's a much broader kind of definition of that. <clears throat> so as we said, GDPR introduced a duty to report certain types of data breach to the, to the uh, relevant authorities, yeah? So it's basically security incidents, the, the confidentiality, integrity, or availability data or any combination of those has actually happened. So in short, you accidentally lose or disclose data to somebody who shouldn't be seeing it. Or someone happens to be able to access the data or pass it on. That's the example I gave about why it's so important to lock your computer terminal if you move away from your desk to save um, unauthorized access. Or if the data, whether it's done accidentally or whether it's done purposely, is either temporarily unavailable, gets corrupted, is lost or destroyed, that all of those issues would be regarded as a personal data breach. <clears throat> as would access by an authorized first uh, third party. So something's happened and somebody's looked at that data or got a hold of it that they shouldn't do, where you've accidentally deleted it, where you've sent it, uh, and I know at the firm where this has actually happened, actually, they sent personal data to the wrong recipient, uh, which caused them all kinds of problems. <clears throat> it could happen. Um, I worked in a business where somebody had their laptop stolen out of their vehicle which did have, and it was an unencrypted laptop at that stage, had data on it, and the company got into very hot water with the, uh, the ICO about that. It's where data has been uh, amended or altered without the client's permission. Now, we're not saying that this is uh, always going to be breached, because with, as with anything, if it's an incident, what you have to do is investigate it and what you have to do is to say, okay, as a result of that investigation, was this a human issue? Was it just a mistake? Somebody pressed the wrong key? Or is it something that's more systemic? We've got a systems issue here that's causing that. And what can we do about it? How can we stop this happening again? How can we prevent it? <clears throat> so from an ICO perspective, Awareness is really important as far as they're concerned. You know, they'll consider that as a controller, you'll become aware of a breach when there's a reasonable degree of certainty that a security incident has occurred. So all of those things that we've just been talking about, that should be ringing bells and lighting the uh, lights on your dashboard to say that I think it's fair to say there's been some sort of uh, some incident there. 
and I'm aware of it. Doesn't mean you've got to report it, it's just got you've got to demonstrate an awareness of it. <clears throat> if a data processor suffers a breach, they should immediately notify the data controller. So that could be a third party, it could be somebody who's handling the data within the firm. As soon as they know there's a breach, it's their job to get on and notify you as the controller of that. <clears throat> So in terms of external data processes, they have to inform you as a delay as soon as they become aware of it. And you must in turn notify the ICO, yeah? As I keep saying, all this should be documented in the contracts you have in place between you and your third party data processor. So what do you need to notify yeah. the ICO yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> it's all about likelihood and severity of risk relating to individual rights and freedoms. That sounds a little bit like uh, motherhood and apply to me, but that is the textbook definition when you read GDPR and you read information on the ICO website and, in turn, and, and indeed the training materials that IFAC provide. So it's one that's worth remembering. It's when there's a likelihood of, uh, of a risk to individuals' uh, rights and freedoms. So there aren't any specific rules. You have to make a judgment call here. So it's, uh, as, as the suggestion is, you know, this personal data has been compromised. Has the individual, as a result of that, could they potentially suffer some sort of emotional distress? Yeah. So think about what we talked about right at the start of the training session. You know, we hold in our business quite a lot of very sensitive personal data. You know, we do look at all that stuff in the round because we need to in order to do our job. If there was a data breach at our firm and that information got out into the domain, would that cause emotional distress to the client? If so, that would be a uh, definitely be a breach. Has there been any physical or material damage as a result of that? So by that, has the, uh, has the individual suffered any kind of material loss, reputation, financial resources, that kind of thing? Again, no hard and fast rules. You need to make a judgment call, assess it on a case-by-case -case fact uh, basis and consider all the relevant factors. <clears throat> If you, having made that consideration, believe it's a notifiable breach, then you have to do it without undue delay, but certainly within 72 hours of becoming aware of it. Yeah. Now, the ICA, ICO are quite reasonable. They know if there's been a data breach, uh, potentially if it's been a systemic data breach as well, um, that it might take you longer than 72 hours to actually be able to remediate that. But what they're saying is, look, at least let us know within 72 hours if you're going to take longer than this to actually provide more information. Just tell us. Tell us, give us reasons for the delay and, and tell us when we expect to see, when we reasonably expect to see some more information on it. <clears throat> So as long as you keep them informed, if you haven't got all the information yet, that's okay. But you do have to understand that in all instances, you have up to 72 hours to notify breaches to the ICO. Otherwise, you'll be in, you'll be in hot water. <clears throat> the report should specify what's happened, who it's affected, how it will be mitigated and resolved. So this is coming back to some of the earlier comments about why it's so important from a GDPR perspective to actually be on top of this and be auditing your processes and systems every year. Because if the worst happens, then you need to be able to demonstrate to them what you're doing, how you're going to resolve it so that you mitigate it and it won't happen again. And as in all things where there's a breach, uh, this must be given absolute priority. So the sufficient resources must be placed uh, at the disposal of a data controller to actually get on and get it sorted just as quickly as possible. <clears throat> but it's worth remembering that not every breach 
does actually need to be reported. Yeah. If you, as a result of your investigation, decide that, well, it's not going to um, severely risk individual rights and freedoms, there won't be massive negative consequences. Yeah. <clears throat> then you don't have to report it. But you do have to, I would assert, uh, justify your rationale behind why you've decided not to report it. Yeah. If it's likely to be a risk, you do have to report it. If it's unlikely, don't report it. But by, you know, you must justify a decision and document it and keep that on file. And again, for those of you um, working with IFAC in this respect, no doubt that's something they'll be looking at in terms of their, their audit process. So always report a severe risk to the ICO within 72 hours. If you feel the breach doesn't need to be reported, fair play, that's your judgment call, but still treat it uh, with the utmost seriously, document it, justify a decision and keep that report. In terms of making that risk assessment, here's just some, some ideas really. So you know, what sort of breach have we, have we had happen here? Is it all my client base? Is it just something? Is it just something like an internal phone directory? So what's the nature, sensitivity and volume of it? How easy would it be to identify the individuals? What's the severity of the consequences? Yeah, any, any special characteristics, you know? So I would suggest that if it was your whole client base and being subject to phishing attack and got off and they've got addresses, payment details, all that thing, highly severe. It was the internal telephone directory that temporarily been made un unavailable. Yeah, it's a breach, but it's not it's not severe. So that's how to assess risk. <clears throat> Where you do perceive, because of the severity and consequences of it, that it is a high risk, then you have to get on and you have to notify those individuals immediately without delay and to be able to demonstrate that you've done that. Yeah. The rationale behind that, of course, is what you're trying to do is to help individuals take steps to protect themselves. Somebody uh, address details, credit card, all the bank account details have gone missing. They obviously need to crack on and take steps to secure their finances from that respect. <clears throat> also, if it's going to be something of a more emotional uh, piece, it help them to kind of prepare for any incoming that they might they might get. So in summary, then, you should investigate and record all breaches, whether or not they need to go to the, uh, the ICO, document the facts, talk to the effects of it, who's affected the severity of it. Importantly, what the ICO will always be looking for is what you're going to do differently next time. What are, the, what are the remediating actions that you're going to take? better processes better systems was it a training issue you know what are you going to do and this is part of your overall obligation to comply with that accountability principle and it's also helpful when you're working with ifac that when they're verifying your compliance that you're you can you're cognizant of and you can demonstrate that you're on top of your notification duties under gdpr regime so even if you don't need to notify a breach, still document it, as I say, facts, effects, remedial action, and that'll help you uh, meet your accountability obligations. We're nearly there now. Again, just a reminder of what happens if uh, the wheel falls off the bike. Um, I've already talked to a maximum that the ICO can, uh, can find you it's 20 million euros or 4% of the global turnover. <clears throat> if it's more of an administrative uh, issue, they would probably seek to uh, look for the standard um, disciplinary regime, which is a bargain. You know, never more, no more 20 million euros. This is only 10 million euros or 2% of your global turnover. So that's if it's an administrative error. If it's anything outside of that, then as I say, you're looking at 4% or 20 mil euros. <clears throat> and it could not just be a fine. So they have other corrective powers under Article 58 of GDPR. So it is so important that you have robust systems and procedures in place, including the reporting of breaches, 
even if you don't notify, don't need to notify a breach, make sure you record all the necessary details so that you don't fall foul of some of these more swinging penalties. As I say, don't take my word for it. Uh, use the search engine of your choice and have a look at some of the fines that were meted out in 2021. So it's always good to be on top of it. <clears throat> so at the start of the session, I said, we were going to take a look at the context for data security. Remember, that's what I was saying about data is the new oil. Yeah, we have got to understand some of the key terminology around data protection um, and what that looks like. I think we, we all understand the difference between personal and sensitive uh, data. And I've spent the majority of the session actually saying these are the key principles of GDPR. I've given a plug to the, uh, the learning materials available to you on, on the BAT system, which are excellent. And we've just, uh, and then we went on to talk about the main compliance with the regime. We had a look at a, a checklist as a starter for 10. And then latterly, we've been looking at what is a personal data breach? How do we report it? When do we need to report it? And how to keep us self safe? <clears throat> so hopefully, uh, when you, you come to take the exams on that system, you'll feel much more confident in terms of your knowledge has been sufficiently refreshed. As always, just as a, a reminder, this is a screenshot of the BAT system that you all use. If you log in on the normal way and go to the TNC section, that's where you'll find the financial exams. But crucially, that's where you'll also find the learning materials as well. So when you click on to things like the GDPR, um, you'll find a whole suite of learning materials at your disposal as well, which I have to say are excellent. Um, just before we open up to, uh, to questions, I, uh, I invite Charlie. For those of you, I know uh, a lot of you like to, uh, to evidence your learning, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, just give you a moment to either do a screenshot or take a photograph of that. So for those of you who would like a uh, CPD training certificate for this morning's session, please uh, feel free to, uh, to drop me an email and uh, we'll make that happen. Okay, good. So <clears throat> that's kind of the end of, uh, of the slides. I can see we've got some things in the, uh, the chat box, which we'll have a look at in, uh, in a tick. Uh, and then I'm going to invite Charlie, hopefully you can uh, you can hear me and I can hear you, hopefully. I don't think he's on anymore, Jeremy. Oh, is he gone? Is that you, Kirsty? It is, yeah. I lost you, part. Sorry, my fault, not yours. Okay. But yeah, I'm not sure where he is. He disappeared quite early, so. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Yeah, um... I'll, I'll just point out then, just, just so that everybody is aware of it, that this, this session has been recorded, including that the slides were part of, of that recording. Uh, that will be sent to, uh, to Charlie, Kirsty, and the team uh, about 20 minutes after this, this session ends, and then they will, they will uh, make that available to you. No problem at all. Okay, good. Okay, so I can see some of you already sending me emails for your training certificates. That's brilliant. I will get on to those this morning. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm conscious there's a lot of material to cover there. I hope for a lot of you it's a refresher. If you feel you need a little bit more uh, meat on the bones, as I say, uh, make yourself familiar with those training materials. Uh, I did the tests myself yesterday. Um, so I'm confident that we've covered everything in sufficient detail to, uh, to help you be successful with those tests. Wish you all the very best with remaining compliant with your GDPR and, uh, and data protection. And uh, in view of the time, I'm going to say uh, goodbye. And uh, for those of you who are on for SMF 16 next week, I, uh, I look forward to seeing you then. So cheers for now and goodbye. Thank you. Cheers. Goodbye.